you can go ahead and set up the recording, Bailey. So I'll give Bailey a second to do that. Um, so just hang on tight. Okay, great. And I also want to thank everyone for um, completing the polls. So we have a distribution between partners, regions, and subgrantees. And in the other poll, I saw that um, folks were interested in hearing about um, improving and building on the relationships they have with the folks that they work with, and also some general information. So as you can see on the screen, um, we've got uh, five panelists here that come from three different GLS grantee sites. From the Massachusetts GLS project, we're joined by Christine Farrell O'Reilly and Allison Brill, both from the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. From Michigan, we have Pat Smith from the Michigan Department of Community Health and Cindy Ewell Foster, who does evaluation work on the project and who is from the University of Michigan. And from the Alaska GLS project, we're joined by James Ganos, and he's in the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. So thanks to you all for joining today. So let's take a minute and learn about the subgrantee at regional setups in each of our panelists' states. So I want to go to um, Christine or Allison first. Can you please describe um, your subgrantee or regional setup in Massachusetts? So maybe you can let us know. Do you work with subgrantees um, or specific regions, and who are they? Uh, yes, this is Christine. So um, we do work with um, subgrantees in most of these areas. Um, so the first one that you're looking at on the right is uh, Cape Cod and the islands. And we have a subgrantee down there, and they have a full-time coordinator. Um, it's a <clears throat> fairly large area. Some of it is more sparsely populated than others. And in the summertime, there's a great increase in the number of people that are there. Wintertime is quieter. Um, the next one to the left is uh, the Taunton area, which is um, mostly in uh, actually Bristol County. We have a very small uh, contract there with a subgrantee for, uh, to work pretty specifically with schools. And um, she's also working to start a coalition um, in that area. And that's probably a little more populated area. The, the central one, North Central Mass, um, we don't actually have a subgrantee there, but Allison Brill from DPH is kind of the coordinator for activities in that area. And that combines some somewhat rural, and uh, there's also small, two small cities in that area. Moving uh, down to the small one uh, in, on the left is the Springfield and Holyoke area, both cities, um, both former manufacturing places. Uh, lot of um, minority uh, populations, particularly Hispanic, in both of those um, areas. And we do hope to have a, a part-time coordinator um, in that area. And the last one is the Berkshire County. So the whole county is part of it. We have a full-time coordinator out there through the um, an agency. And um, that is um, largely rural, rural area, probably one of the most rural areas in our whole state. All right, thanks very much. Um, maybe we can move over to uh, Pat or Cindy. Can you do the same for Michigan, please? Sure, this is Pat. Um, we issued an RFP um, in the, uh, all our projects are done at the county level. <clears throat> and um, some, um, such as in the, the lower half of the lower peninsula, or the mitten, as it's known. Um, those are more highly populated areas, um, except for Van Buren. That's a, a fairly rural county. But Washtenaw, Ottawa, especially Macomb. Macomb is a very urban county. Um, Washtenaw is where the University of Michigan is, Ann Arbor, some other um, larger towns and cities. Um, Ottawa is where Holland, Michigan is, if any of you know of Holland, Michigan. And um, a, a big tourist area in the summer, of course. It's on Lake Michigan, um, but, a, but a fairly large county. Then when you get up into the upper half of the lower peninsula, and of course in the upper peninsula, it gets much more rural. Uh, Crawford and Roscommon counties, those were two counties involved in one project. 
uh, the Grand Traverse area, Traverse City, Michigan, um, a big tourist area, but year-round tourism, so the, the population stays fairly high there. It's also a big area for retirees, I've, I've learned. Um, Chippewa County, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, um, again, a very rural area, um, one big city, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. The, um, there was also a tribal grant in that area, the Sioux Tribe of Michigan. Then you get over into the most rural areas of the state, the western half of the Upper Peninsula, long way away from Lansing where we are, um, and what's called Copper Country there in the Houghton and Baraga counties. Uh, our projects, um, some are with uh, community mental health agencies, a couple are with public health agencies. I'm talking in the present tense, although the projects have ended at this point. Um, and one with a, actually with a crisis center. But they're all community-based uh, prevention and early intervention programs. Great. Thanks very much, Pat. And then I'll turn it over to you, James, for Alaska, please. OK. Well, I'm lo located down here in Juneau, as you can see in the south, uh, southeast panhandle there. Um, and we work primarily with uh, uh, Southeast uh, uh, organizations, tribal organizations here, uh, some located in Sitka. But, and those are the, the kind of the main hubs, Sitka, Ketchikan, you can get to Wrangell in there, and, um, and Prince of Wales a little bit farther south. Um, however, there's a lot, a lot of other rural communities in the region uh, where many of our subgrantees are focused on um, that are not on that map. And uh, many of these communities are, are off the road, any major highway um, uh, road systems. However, we are connected by, by plane, ferry, services, et cetera. So transportation sometimes can be a challenge for us to, to come together and, and meet. Up north, um, Fairbanks is another area that's one of our sub-grantees. And Fairbanks, the Fairbanks borough uh, is probably about the, the second largest uh, urban population in Alaska. However, they do work somewhat with some other outlying communities. And we also partner with another GLS grantee up there uh, that's, that's in that region that focuses on more of the rural, rural areas, outlying communities in Fairbanks. Um, Northwest Arctic. Um, we've had a lot of other partnerships and, and former uh, uh, grantees that are working in the area, but they're also Dearly Smith grantees. And on occasion, we will come together and share and partner and share resources together. So they're also another an important area of the state. And then uh, down a little further south of there, you see Bethel. Bethel is also off-road system. Um, primarily, it's, it's rural. They serve about 56 villages throughout the area. And um, the villages there are between maybe, uh, you know, between two, 300 people up to about 1,200 people on average. Uh, and Bethel is uh, the main hub uh, that services many of those communities. So the, they also are an important uh, partner in, in our work. And then right dead smack in the middle there is South Central Alaska. That's where Anchorage is. And um, not that we have any, any uh, 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 formal uh, partnerships right now with, with any of our sub-grantees in that region, they're so instrumental because it really serves half our, half our population, and it provides the pool of supports and resources. And oftentimes, that's the hub where everyone comes together and meets, and we have trainings, et cetera. Um, but that's also uh, another strategic um, location where we do a lot of our work. Thanks, James. Great. So I'd like to ask Bailey to prep us to unmute all of your phones. And uh, after that, we're going to hear from Julie. So uh, Bailey, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, if you know you have a noisy background, if you could self-mute your phone, uh, that would be great. I might be muting you if I hear noise in the background, but otherwise, I will unmute your phone lines now. Great. Thank you, Bailey. So um, I wanted to ask panel, how do you provide um, capacity, sorry, how do you build capacity or provide technical assistance? Um, to your regions of focus, you know, do you have um, monthly calls with them? Do you, you know, have an annual meeting? Um, how how do you go about that? Um, maybe um, Pat and Cindy, you could start us off. Um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. This is Pat, and um, 
I think the the strongest technical, well, we did two separate things that um, were actually kind of the biggest technical assistance activities that we had with our grant. And one I'll let Cindy talk about um, in terms of really proactive outreach in terms of the evaluation of the local projects, which we expected the local grantees to do themselves. And we learned in our first round of funding that you really have to reach out to them, um, be in, in proactive contact, contact with your local um, grantees, because they won't come to you even though you say um, your expectations are for evaluation. And um, you know we have an evaluator you can call. Um, we actually had Cindy call them and work with them right from the very first day that we met. Um, and then we also had an annual, what we called a community technical assistance meeting that we opened up to anybody in the state that was interested in suicide prevention at the community level. And it was a uh, two-day meeting. We'd bring in speakers, but we really wanted it to be hands-on. Um, very practical information, and we also set it up specifically so that people could network with each other. It was done in an informal setting. Meals were family style at the conference center we met at. Um, there were bonfires at night where people could just sit and have a beer and talk about their programs or about whatever, but really get to know each other from across the state. And uh, Cindy, why don't you talk about the evaluation? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Cindy Foster from the University of Michigan, and um, you know, I think we tried to do a couple of um, couple of different things strategically with our sub grantees to try to um, you know increase their level of participation in the evaluation process. So, one of the things that Pat did that I thought was really important was that when each of our sub grantees um, was notified that they were funded, we um, expected all of them to travel just one time in three years to Lansing and sort of be all together and launch their grants so that everyone received the same information at the same time to sort of kick off um, you know, their, what the regulatory requirements were and that type of thing. And my role in that meeting was to really um, try to um, talk about the importance of evaluation and um, you know, talk about the ways in which they could participate in that process and how it was really beneficial to them and what they were doing. So, um, you know, I think I shared some slides with um, Adam and Julie that, that we used. And, um, you know, the first just is a sampling. So here's, you know, sort of one um, slide from a presentation that I did at that kickoff meeting that was really just trying to increase their confidence, try to remove any barriers or understand what might be um, increasing hesitancy about evaluation. Um, and really trying to set up a strategic planning process for them around their local evaluation plans. Um, and again, helping them to see that what they were doing, even at the local level, really could contribute nationally to our understanding about suicide prevention. Um, I'm sorry, did I? Hey, thank you so much. No, that's, that's wonderful. wonderful. Um, so I guess the, um, o the other piece that I would add is that at these technical assistance meetings, we had folks um, work on um, developing logic models and other strategic plans kind of from the very beginning of their grants around evaluation. Yeah, the community technical assistance meetings were also our annual grantee meetings, and the grantees were expected to be there. So I'm going to um, move on to uh, Massachusetts. So Christine or Allison, maybe you can just share a little bit more briefly because I know we're trying to highlight some of the different activities um, on different questions. Sure. Um, this is Christine speaking. So our um, subgrantees this time are um, two of them are the same as we had last time. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit. When we initially started, we met with um, groups in each of those areas and did, which were called community health network areas. They were the ones that actually applied for the grant. And we did a little um, suicide 101 presentation for their group so that everybody was aware uh, kind of on the same page. And we also then gave a description of um, what the grant was and um, what some of the expectations would be. We also had, a we had meetings with our evaluators in each of the areas. And this time we've done it mostly by phone because two of them are very familiar with all, all the forms since um, they were funded the last time. We also hold monthly calls with our coordinators as a group. Uh, we check in, get updates, clarify any issues, 
and we discuss their activities, which sometimes can prompt ideas for others, and they can explore ways of doing things um, that others might have tried. Um, we also ch often check in with them um, individually, and they're very good at contacting us. Um, they have no problem with calling us or our evaluators. Um, and we also will attend their local um, group meetings and events that they organize. Thank you. Um, James, can you share a little bit about um, how you work with your regional partners to build capacity or do TA? Well, sure. Like similar to the other states, you know, we get folks together and we have those kind of initial, you know, grantee meetings just to kind of orient them. And, and as everyone knows on the phone, you know, when, when you put out an RFP and, and you apply for that and, and that gets awarded, you know, several months go by and so many things have changed. And so it's, it's just figuring out, you know, um, a logistics of, of of, of what's required, what's expected, making sure they're getting all the tools and resources so they could uh, go back to their, their regions or their communities to do the work. Um, but we also, and I think more importantly, which I think is, is so uh, important, is, is that we actually go and, and to the site and we invite them not only to bring their staff in, but also you know, the way we had set up our, our grants was for them to work with the regional team. So they're bringing other stakeholders, other providers, other community folks that, that are instrumental uh, in being able to uh, come together and go through that strategic planning process as a group as opposed to this being siloed by you know, one agency or, or one group. Um, and those are really helpful because that way they, they all uh, could meet face to face, you know, build that really necessary social capital as partners and as a combination of partners and providers and stakeholders to determine, you know, what what resources you do have and, you know, what's the direction forward. And then also we would, once that's set up, we would come in and a requirement that we had of our grant was that they um, provide the Alaska Gatekeeper training, it's a training that we had developed here in the state. Um, so we help them uh, train trainers that can go out and, and tailor the training um, based on their their regional needs and capacity, uh, and and folks that that really could benefit from the training. Great, thank you. Um, so it sounds like that process also would get folks to, um, you know, kind of get buy into the process and feel some ownership over it as well. So um, Adam, you want to share the next question? Sure, you can do that. We'll pull it up. Thanks, Bailey. Okay, so another question that we had was. How do you encourage strategic planning in the groups that you work with? Uh, so we'll go to the panel before we hear from you in the audience. And uh, I'd like to actually go to Massachusetts first with this. So either um, Christina or Allison, you can take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Allison from Massachusetts. Um, so one way we encourage st strategic planning is by uh, having our subgrantees complete a regional project planning sheet, uh, which I believe we have uh, will be up on the screen soon. Uh, this, so this tool gives our subgrantees um, a look at the ideas and plans that they have for fit, fulfilling the grant objectives over the three-year period, and also helps them prioritize and organize their goals. And it also is a way to map out their projects and activities in a logical way. Yep, there it is. Uh, so this tool helps us ensure that our subgrantees are coordinating certain activities with us, uh, DPH, so we're all working together on similar or joint initiatives. Uh, so for example, uh, we at DPH are coordinating activities that engage residential homeless uh, and runaway youth programs. So if a subgrantee has relationships with, with these types of programs in their areas, we want them to coordinate with us about how they'll include them in their local activity plans. Great, thanks very much, Allison. Um, I'd like to also hear from James in Alaska on this one. Can you tell us about the planning process and the prevention plans from the subgrantees that you're working with? We also coordinate our what we call our Comprehensive Behavioral Health Prevention and Early Intervention Services Grant. One of the things we recognize here in Alaska is that when you're talking about suicide or you're talking about uh, uh, substance abuse or you're talking about uh, domestic violence, we know that they kind of they're interrelated. And so we developed a comprehensive prevention program. And back around 2006, 2007, when I came on board, uh, our section had adopted the, the SAMHSA strategic prevention framework as a planning tool for our communities 
to best address these behavioral health issues. And so if you're familiar with that, it's the five steps of assessment, uh, capacity building, planning, implementation, and evaluation. And so what we did with this, uh, this RFP, we asked our regional suicide prevention teams who are applying for these grants to go through that process. So that was our, our first uh, attention to detail with getting them the TA necessary support was to help them through that process. Because uh, I, I could tell you a community grantee oftentimes can be very um, intimidated by going through that assessment process. So what we try to do is just help them through that process and of course, we, we, we like data. We asked them to, to go ahead and, and, and think about data. Um, we want to make sure they have it on, on their radar screen. Uh, but more importantly, tell us about your community. You guys are the experts in your community. Tell us about your community. And gather information that helps us better understand what your, what your needs are. Um, so we help them go through that process. Um, and then the capacity building, too, is just so, so critical. That's why we asked them to do this um, when they set these regional teams up to have a really diverse uh, composition of folks who, who are partnering with them. Um, and it's, an, it's really step two, but I think the capacity is just ongoing. It needs to happen all the time. So um, being able to pay attention to the capacity uh, piece is so important. And then the planning process, be, be able to um, prioritize uh, uh, so it needs resources in a way that they can begin to think strategically about what activities or services they want to put. And, and, um, and then we can help them along with that as well. And then the first year is the three-year grant, and the first we give them up to 12 months to put together their strategic plan. Uh, and I believe, Adam, you had some uh, um, slide shots of, of some of the plans. And what we found out was, you know, in all three of these regions where we had these uh, teams are all different, they're all unique, and their planning process was unique, and their output of their plans were unique. And you can kind of get, get an idea of um, um, that, like for example, here in Southeast Alaska, uh, there is a strong focus on, on Alaska Native culture, and so they put a lot of emphasis on that, and, and that's um, kind of the flavor and the, and the direction they went in with their strategic planning on moving more upstream within that prevention spectrum to think about wellness. Um, as opposed to Fairbanks, uh, Fairbanks was a much more uh, strategic thinking about those who are most vulnerable at risk and how can we better identify and get supports and services to those um, you know, who are, are acutely at risk of suicide so we can prevent suicide. So they all went about it differently, but um, they all went through the same process. And I think for me, the, the really the challenge was how can we get them to go through that process with fidelity so they can get the most sustainability out of their project? And that's what really the goal of the SPIF is, is, is for people to go through that process and then at the end of the day that they're doing it with some cultural relevance and also some sustainable, sustainable projects at the end of it. Thanks very much, James. And I wanted to uh, go to the Michigan folks quickly. Patterson, if you had any additional pieces to add. Um, just go ahead. Well, certainly in Michigan, we felt that um, having them respond to a major RFP, our grants were $45,000 a year to the local grantees so that they could do some substantive work in the communities. And we felt that really was um, initial strategic planning for them, coming up with the plan um, to, um, to do a program funded by us. But um, I think a lot of what kick-started the, the communities we ultimately funded was their work with Cindy and in the logic models. And she can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. I think um, Adam and Julie just have an example of one of our subgrantees, which was um, Macomb County. And so, you know, at that initial kickoff meeting, we gave everyone a, um, a template and really taught about how to do logic models, and the templates came from SPRC. They were just um, a wealth of information and resources for us. 
Um, and then they had a couple of months to really go home, work with their coalitions, and really think about their project um, from an evaluation standpoint. And then we met them a few months later at the TA meeting, and they came with their drafts and had individual consultations, really thinking about, you know, how are you going to use evaluation for sustainability? What types of questions in the field are you set up to answer with your local evaluation plans? Um, so here's an example of how um, Macomb County, whose project was really related to means restriction education and family support follow-ups for um, folks who've been recently discharged or discharged from an emergency department, um, you know, how they took each of their program components that they came to us in their RFP saying that they wanted to do, but how they could break them apart and use cross-site evaluation instruments as well as other local evaluation strategies to answer particular questions and then really understanding how um, you know, those questions could serve them over time from a sustainability standpoint, you know, getting extra grant funding. And, um, you know, the reason we're highlighting Macomb is because they were so successful. Um, they collected data on, you know, about 700 kids over three years, and we've really successfully spun that into, a, you know, an additional grant for them. So um, they're a success story. Thanks very much, Cindy. I'll just put us back in the other screen here. Great. So I wanted to have the audience um, provide some input, too. Now, if you've got um, some thoughts to share on how um, you've encouraged strategic planning in the groups that you work with, uh, please go ahead and uh, speak up. Or um, if you prefer, you can use the hand raise option and we'll call on you. But please feel free to go ahead and share. We've got a shy group Kareen. today. <laughs> a little bit. I see Corinne. Corinne's typing um, down in the chat box there. So just to reiterate the question, um, it's how do you encourage strategic planning in the regions that you're working with or um, in your subgrantees? And Corinne says they had an RFP with a strategic plan using a comprehensive approach and uh, they fund college grantees. And I wonder if you might share with us um, a little more about that, how it might be a more u a unique situation if you're funding college grantees. Um, if you wouldn't mind, you can do that. Um, you can do it verbally if you want, um, or if you find it easier to chat, then um, go ahead. Uh, well, we use the comprehensive approach from the Jed Foundation, and we at, we t um, put that in the RFP, and they had to fill out each area, and then once they submitted their RFP, we reviewed it with them and made sure that there was an evidence-based practice in each area and kind of realigned them if they didn't fit in the right area. And then we um, have monthly phone calls or emails and then we've had, we had a kickoff meeting where we explained all the cross-site evaluation tools and our local evaluation and then we're meeting actually next month to have a one-year follow-up and see where they're at so they can um, amend their plans and get on track for the next year. Thanks, Corinne. We also have a community focus where we fund regional action councils to do um, work as well, using QPR and Connect and giving little um, town, like little grants to towns to do their own suicide prevention initiative. That's a best practice. Great. Thanks for sharing. I see another chat in from Ann Kirkwood. She's asking. How do you ensure they fulfill their obligations? And I wonder if either the, the panel or anyone else in the audience would kind of want to get at that question from the angle of how would you build that into strategic planning with them? I know there's some oversight that probably goes on um, you know, with administering subgrantees, but from a strategic planning perspective, can anyone share how they've sort of um, built that into the work they're doing? Uh, 
Um, not giving money. Uh, we give uh, money at, in increments, not all up at front. So they have deliverables, and once they meet the deliverables, we continue funding. But we have monthly deadlines instead of a, a quarterly deadline like um, ICF implements. All right, thank you. This is Christine, um, and we did that also. They um, it was it was a grant. They got the money in um, in chunks, but it was by by quarter, and um, through you know through the regular contact that we had with the calls and getting the um, information for the PSI, so we could see what they were doing. Um, we were able to uh, to keep track and. Actually, with our last grant, um, we did end up uh, terminating um, one of the the um, subcontractees' um, contract because we felt that there was it was not good performance. Yeah, this is Pat in Michigan. It was really more administrative oversight rather than strategic planning to ensure they fulfilled their obligations. Um, we did have quarterly reporting, um, but they. We had a template with very specific questions we wanted answered, um, both on progress, on their um, objectives, but also discussions of barriers they encountered, how they overcame them, or what they were working on to overcome them. Um, we did ask about, in the, the last year, about you know what were they doing about sustainability planning, um, things like that. So it, it really was more from an administrative oversight. Did an, I did an annual site visit with them so that we could have discussions not only with the people who were directly working on the project, but their partners also. Thanks, Pat. I think Anne is typing in the bottom there. Anne has chatted in. Is there a price to pay in community perceptions of your program when you pull funding? Oh yeah, this is Pat. Um, we, in our first three years of funding, we had um, six subgrantees, in, and they were all aware that if we got refunded, it would be a competitive um, process again. And there was only one grantee that got refunded. And there were some very bitter feelings out there. But I think in the three years between when the first group applied and when, when we um, issued the second RFP, that um, interest in the state had increased, across the state had increased dramatically. A lot more thought had been given. A lot more work had been done at the local level around um, what do we need to be doing around suicide prevention. And basically, my, my grantees in that first round, I don't think um, they, they couldn't write a strong enough proposal. It was strong enough the first time around, but they didn't grow enough, I think, in terms of their capabilities. And it was a tougher competition the second time around. And there, there were some really bitter feelings in, in some of those communities that they didn't get um, another three years of funding. And I would just add, this is Cindy, that that, that was a really important learning process for us. And, um, and for us, you know, a really, um, you know, fundamental reminder about how, um, how important it is to have people um, plan for sustainability from the minute the money hits the bank account. Because I think, you know, that we hadn't done that as well the first time around. And I think these other subgrantees felt, you know, didn't feel as prepared for the loss of funding. And you know, from the beginning, we were able to say with the second cohort, you know, this money is going away. Um, you have to really plan for this. And um, so I, I think it, it serves the second group, you know, our learning experience. Thanks, Cindy. I wanted to check in with the other participants to see if anyone had a similar experience to share um, that we heard about from um, Pat, Cindy, and, and Christine also mentioned um, something along similar lines. So anyone else want to share their experience there, maybe with um, dropping a subgrantee or transitions in that regard? Yeah. 
do other folks have other kinds of strategic um, planning tools or processes they have used that they would like to share? All right, well, thanks um, to the panel for that one, and also um, to the couple questions we got there. Thanks for that. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Julie to continue on with the next um, question for the panel. Great. Thanks, Adam. So actually, I'm going to um, open this one up to um, everyone in the audience to start with. Um, or I'm curious to hear what kinds of networking strategies, if any, you've used to connect folks from your various re regions of focus um, to the other regions. So go ahead and, you know, um, say them aloud with folks in the audience if you have some that you'd like to share or feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you if you prefer. Hello, this is Daniel Bill. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, wondering if uh, uh, there has been face-to-face uh, -face meetings of uh, uh, sub-grantees to talk about discussions or talk about uh, successes and failures that each is having and how to uh, promote success. Great question, Daniel. Thank you. Um, Maybe the panel, does anybody want to um, start off answering that question? I believe that um, Pat and Cindy had already talked a little bit about uh, your annual TA meeting. I think that was a feature there, but I think also um, in Massachusetts, that's something that you guys have done? Um, this is Christine uh, from Mass. Well, we, um, this time around, we haven't um, had as many meetings because where the grantees were already, um, you know, had done successful projects. So um, they had done all their strategic planning last time, and so they're really up, up and running. But we did, um, you know, have meetings that time with everybody um, and trying to assist um, each other so that if there was any barriers or problems that people were having by having a discussion about it. And, and that also actually, you know, was something that could come up in the monthly calls because we have these regular um, calls and that would be an opportunity for people to talk about maybe a population that they were trying to reach or getting, you know, into schools or whatever um, the issue might be. So I think we kind of did that on somewhat an ongoing. And then, of course, when they would have um, a great event or a successful, you know, say a screening in a school or something like that. That was also part of what was shared um, on the calls. Thank you. James, um, do you want to say a little bit more about your strategies on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, back in 2010, uh, when we first started bringing in some federal funds and, and the state was showing, you know, a strong interest in the work that we were doing, um, However, a lot of us that work at the state level, we, we didn't know everyone and where folks were doing the work and actually what was happening. So it was difficult for us. We kind of knew we had some of the projects and programs and services that we were, we were running, but we didn't have a good uh, understanding of what everyone was doing in the state. And everyone would ask us, hey, what's going on? And, and um, we didn't have all that information. You know, we had Indian Health Services had some funding that, that was here. Native Aspirations was doing some work with many of our rural tribal communities. And um, we put together a, a suicide prevention summit back in January of 2010 where we brought everyone together. And the first, our first order on the agenda was, was to present the idea that we're really stronger than we know. And we're doing a lot of good work out there. And, and for us to kind of recognize and celebrate that, you know, our rates are some of the highest or the highest in the nation. Um, but there's a lot of good work going on that we have a lot to be hopeful about. And so that was the, our first sort of it uh, on the agenda, and people recognize that uh, we have a lot of good people here uh, working on this, and it's our stories, I think the, the stories of successes that really bring, um, bring attention to the issue, helps build our awareness around it, um, and I think it really helps inspire and motivate people uh, to, do, to do good work. 
So I think that was really helpful. Um, and it also gave us a chance to kind of assess what we were doing statewide and where the gaps were and where we needed to drive um, as a state all working together. Thanks, James. Um, we're putting up on the screen, it might take a second for folks to see um, uh, some information from some of your different um, partners. I wonder if you could say a little bit about this um, document that we're putting up. This regional team uh, that we were working with uh, was from the upper Cuscoquim or middle Cuscoquim area uh, in the Yukon Delta uh, in the Bethel region. And um, here's a, an area that, that um, um, decided that they wanted to work together with uh, four of the villages, neighboring villages. And there are some of these communities are, are just a few miles apart on the river. Um, some are a little farther. Um, however, they they all have uh, some of uh, the um, very common issues, needs, uh, resources to address some of the the, the issues surrounding suicide um, that they've been experiencing in that region. Um, so we we had them uh, come together and meet with us and put together, go through that strategic planning process that I explained earlier, and, and come up with, with, with their plan. And um, I, from my experience, um, I think it was very challenging for them to go through that, that, that strategic prevention framework, they relied on ground assistance and support in doing that, and having folks that, that could really articulate what the vision is for their communities. And this is what they came up with as a group. Um, and we helped them along, but um, this is what, what they came up with. And if you kind of look at some of those strategies there, if you could see some of the small print there, um, it's very culturally centered and very appropriate and very relevant to their work and, and also based on their ability and the capacity that they have to do the work. Um, and, but they also had a reliance on the local hub community in Bethel to pr provide more of the the you know, formal services associated with both those at risk. Um, so and I just want to interrupt for one sec, James, yep. to say that if um, folks are having trouble reading the print, you can try pressing the full screen button on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and then to come out of that mode, you can just press that again. But that might help to, to zoom it in a little bit more. So I just want to just cap that, uh, that off there that um, it just required a lot of I think building of that social capital I spoke about earlier. Um, you know, we're a big state, uh, but we're a small population, and building relationships is so key and essential. Uh, and being able to, to, um, I had the opportunity to go and spend two weeks there in 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 one of the villages, and I would go and travel to the other villages, and I was providing some some gatekeeper training and support to them. Um, but it, I think it just helped a lot, really, to get to understand uh, who they are, what their needs are, and what kind of supports are. are or what kind of supports were needed uh, for them to carry through. And again, I'd have to say the SPIF probably didn't, um, we, I don't think we're able to meet the fidelity of that SPIF going through that, going through that process, the formal steps uh, and going through that process. Um, however, at the end of the day, you know, even though we're, we're, uh, we ended our three-year uh, uh, grant uh, agreement with them, um, we continue to work with them. I think that kind of speaks volumes for our ability to continue the work. Great. Thank you so much. So again, I'm going to turn it back to the audience. I'm, I'm really curious to hear from other folks what kinds of um, strategies you have to help people network or learn from each other, come together um, in your area or your grant. So. So I see um, Patty and um, Jan from Kentucky. I'm wondering if maybe you could say a little bit about what's going on in Kentucky. One of the things that we've done is we offered um, mini grants to our regional um, prevention centers as a way to use them, to let them um, begin to disseminate into their communities as well. And, and they've only been up and running for about six months at this point, so they have a couple of different projects very um, based on what their expertise is. We've got one group that's working with youth, uh, one group that's, that's really strong with um, TSAs. And um, so, so each one is, is very culturally competent for their communities. And um, then in addition to that, we're, just, we're working on connecting our QPR trainers across the state. 
Uh, we have about 500 people that are trained here, and so working really hard to make sure that they are uh, working together and building off of each other. And um, really just trying to get you know, everybody connected and, and moving in the same direction um, at this point. Dan, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I would say also our learning collabs that we've formed with education and you know, starting with higher education as well. Um, also looking at, we were able to tap in with education into a, a statewide list serve that counselors are part of, that uh, you know, other education-related entities are part of. And so you know, not just in the, there are identified regions with our grant, but even across the whole state. Thank you and we're also much. making um, use. Oh. We're also making use of the, the Adobe Connect, uh, Connect webinar capability to do some of those those meetings and collaboratives as well. Great, thank you very much, um, Patty and Jan, for um, speaking to our question here. I wanted to um, address Corinne. We're going to um, go to your question from the chat here. Um, I'll read them out loud first, and then, Corinne, we're going to um, give you a chance to um, chat in verbally to share more if you want. Um, Corinne said, we provide trainings um, like Connect and QPR, but we're a small state. And we've also, uh, we also have a coalition of non-granted colleges meet monthly and provide them with professional development. I wonder, Corinne, if you might speak to your second point there. Well, we have something called the Connecticut Healthy Campus Initiative that focuses on um, a wide variety of things, but we also include suicide prevention. So, and it's off, the other focus is underage drinking prevention. So we usually, every month we have a meeting during the academic year and we provide them either with um, new, news and trends in the industry or we can bring in a speaker that, that has a, a knowledge on the topic. So, um, for example, in, in um, February, we're having the JED come in, and we're going to use a comprehensive approach for suicide prevention and link it to alcohol and um, substance abuse. And that's for non-granted colleges as well. And this coalition has been in, in existence for 12 years. Great. Thanks very much, Corinne. I think I saw hands raised from Allison and Christine, um, two of our panelists. So I wanted to um, give them the floor. Hi, this is Allison, Massachusetts. Um, I just wanted to share some other ideas that we have that we've been doing um, to encourage networking. Um, so, in addition to monthly calls, which other folks have mentioned, um, we let's see, we have a statewide coalition for suicide prevention that our coordinators attend, so they can see each other regularly and um, continue the conversations that we have on the monthly calls and you know share ideas and. Uh, brainstorm. Um, there's also regional coalitions in in the three areas, or one one is forming in Taunton area, but in the uh, Cape and Berkshire, there's regional coalitions, and we encourage that our our um, coordinators to attend each other's each other's uh, coalition meet, meeting, or the coalitions each have events and trainings that they put on, uh, so we encourage them to attend each other's events. Um, and at, let's see, our coordinator on the Cape and Islands was recently a, a nominated and won an award at our um, national or statewide um, suicide prevention state house awards day, which recognizes the leadership and advocacy of of, um, of folks and organizations in the state. So it was a way of, of recognizing success, uh, relating back to um, maybe it was Daniel Bill's question earlier, um, and. No, I'm, I'm forgetting who it was, whether it was um, Allison, whether it was in Massachusetts or if this was in Michigan, but I know when we had chatted previously, you were talking about sharing um, expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, speakers. yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So one thing we, we encourage is resource sharing, and one way we, we do that is if, a, if one of our coordinators has, say, an out-of-state expert coming to to an er another area, um, we we can maybe we can it's possible to to share the costs and have the presenter uh, do another presentation in a different part of the state. So we can share those those the transportation costs. 
Great, thank you. I see uh, Lisa Reed is typing in. Someone else, um, anybody else want to speak on this topic? Well, let's move on to our next question, and um, we can always come back to this if Lisa's point was relevant to this question. All right. So I'm going to clear off this piece here. All right. So the next question we had um, for the panelists and the audience is, uh, what are two pieces of advice that you have about working with regions or subgrantees? We heard a little bit about that um, previously, but perhaps maybe can share one thing um, that went well with a subgrantee or region and maybe a, a lesson learned that you could share as well. And um, feel free to go ahead and speak up, um, but maybe we'll go um, to James first, if you don't mind, James. Sure. Well, I said earlier, we're, you know, we're a big state, we're a small population, and, and you know, I, I've only been here um, since 99. And I still feel like um, I, I, I know a lot of people here, but I continue to, to meet new people. Um, and I think that's, that's probably so, um, so important and valuable for me to continue to, to make sure that, that my, my, um, in my professional career that, that my world doesn't exist, you know, just here in the four, off, in the four walls of my office. Um, so I travel quite a bit, and I think that social capital uh, can be far enough. And um, as, as much as we can, um, um, you know, put those resources together. And if you look at a lot of our, our grantees um, and you look at their budgets, a lot of it is focused on travel. Um, we're such a large state. We're so diverse uh, geographically and otherwise. Um, there's some definite challenges for us to build that social capital. So as much as we could use, you know, Internet technology and, 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 and do webinars and those things, I think they're cost effective and they're valuable. At the same time, it really, uh, it's really required of us, I think, to be out and working with folks face-to-face -face in, in the communities that they, they live in. Um, so I would say don't underestimate, underestimate the, the power of, of relationships that you can have with, with folks, in, especially in our rural communities. And also to be flexible. Like I said earlier, you know, we, we ask folks to adopt that strategic, strategic prevention framework. Um, however, we want to make sure that, that what, they're, what they're doing in their planning process is relevant and meaningful. It's got to be, and and we got to do our best to make sure that we're tailoring supports and resources to make sure that it is re relevant and meaningful for for people that we work with. Thanks very much, James. Um, this is Pat in Michigan. I think you know one of the big lessons we learned again from um, you know having done the worked with uh, grantees in our first round of funding and then in our second round of funding is that um, we learned we needed to be somewhat prescriptive in terms of our expectations um, and how we structured the, their, uh, the RFP and, and what we expected them to be doing locally, um, just leaving it kind of wide open and saying, well, you know, here's, you know, loosely based on the, the federal RFP that we had to respond to. And so in, in the second RFP, uh, we, there was a list of seven um, things that they had to plan to do at least four of them, four of the seven. Um, and they could do other things, too, that were prevention and early intervention focused. But um, they had to include at least four um, of the items that included, you know, building um, local leadership, both youth and adult around the issue. Um, surveillance was another one. Um, and I'm not going to remember all of them now because it's been a long time since I've looked at the RFP. But um, that, that made it easier for my end because people were doing similar things. And in terms of just program oversight, it, it made it easier. But also, I think it just made the expectations clearer. Um, and it, it wasn't that we were being totally inflexible, but um, there were certain expectations that needed to be met so that we could meet um, our obligations on our federal grant. And so we, we had to make that very clear to the local grantees. And that, that was fine. I mean, it was all things that they should have been doing anyway. So. 
So um, this is Christine, and um, just talking about um, a little bit about advice about working with the regions. Our experience was um, something very good. On the Cape and Islands, there was already a suicide prevention coalition that had been formed, but it was really strengthened as a result of the work of the coordinator in, um, through the grant. And the collaboration that was available um, was really fantastic because so many people were already at the table. And it really, um, I think, added to um, the success because they did a lot of um, collaborative um, activities and could support each other. And it's also really great for sustainability because the coalition was also doing some fundraising efforts which were um, benefiting uh, youth on the Cape as well. And in Berkshire County, where there had been no suicide prevention coalition and the form of, uh, and the formation of one was a goal of the prior grant, um, and so there was one formed. And today, it's a very vibrant and active coalition. It has lots of events and trainings that they do. And now that we have the grant again, they're working again. Collabor they're collaborating with the coordinator out there. And um, so really, in both of these areas, the youth suicide prevention work continued. Um, even so, for sustainability, it, it was really very, very key. Um, and I think that for a lesson learned, um, you know, the evaluation piece was really important, that we really had to make sure that all the systems were in place, that everybody knew what, what was re um, required. And um, I think that having that very upfront and very clear was, um, was helpful. Thanks very much, Christine. And I'll invite uh, any audience folks that have any pieces of wisdom to share also. Um, please go ahead and share them. I wanted to uh, go back to Lisa's comment quickly um, so we can, I just want to recognize that um, Lisa had chatted in talking about media calls and specifically in response to um, the gun control proposal. But I wanted to know more generally if anyone had used media in any way to try and help um, their subgrantees uh, connect with each other and network. I know we heard from um, Jan in Kentucky that they're using the webinar platform that we're using right now to do some of that a little bit um, in terms of collaborating and meeting. Um, but I wondered if anybody else had uh, any thoughts to share on how they've done that in the past. So not hearing any um, other comments about that, let's move on. And um, this is kind of more of an open-ended piece where I'm just curious to hear from the panel um, if there's anything else that you would highlight about um, doing this kind of work, both you know, any advice or um, any successes that you felt really excited about. I know some folks shared some already, such as the Cape and the Islands um, Award. Um, and it's also a great time for any of the audience to um, share any, any questions in general about this kind of work. So um, maybe we can start with Michigan. Yeah, um, this is Pat. And I think the one thing that kind of um, pops into my head here is, and, and you know, it kind of refers back to to the the question on networking. Is we took advantage of the fact that we had um, sub grantees that were doing very interesting work. In some instances, um, unique work. Other times, maybe not so unique, like putting together a a coalition or. Uh, we had one whiz-bang co um, coalition coordinator in, in one of our sub-grantees. And we took advantage of that when we had our statewide technical assistance meetings so that they, we would ask um, 
our subgrantees to do some of the breakout sessions to share their lessons learned and their successes and their problem solving with others from around the state. And um, I think that was incredibly valuable. And I think that it, it helped other communities learn um, what, you know, what barriers there are, possible ways to overcome them, um, to see that other communities have problems too, getting coalitions up on run, and running or getting into schools to do programming or whatever. And um, so I think that, and our grantees were excited to be able to share what they were doing. And so I think, I don't want to say taking advantage of your local grantees, but, but really collaboratively, collaboratively using um, what they're learning and figuring out how you can share it with others across the state who you might not be working with or funding at this point, I think is extremely valuable. That's a great um, example. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, and I would just add, this is Cindy, also from Michigan, that um, you know, as someone who is interested um, in you know how we build capacity at the local level and how things, you know, our practices are culturally informed and are really meeting the local needs, I just um, would stress that you know it has been such a rewarding experience for us to work with these sub grantees, um, particularly in our current economic environment, because this is really how you build capacity at the local level, right? Instead of spending your money setting up a centralized infrastructure that that can't be sustained when the money goes away, you know, we really feel very good about. Um, you know, putting our money into local communities. And there is more of an administrative burden, and Pat could, you know, do a, an entire webinar probably about that, um, that, she, you know, that she managed beautifully. But I, but I think, you know, as we watched our grant end, we felt like people um, were really in very good shape because they were so embedded in their local communities and really had so much, you know, community support at the end of their three years. So. Um, you know, I just think that's just a bid for doing this kind of work, um, you know, for others. And um, I guess the other example that I would give of the way that at the local level we benefited at the state level is, for example, you know, when our state suicide prevention group wanted to evaluate our state plan, we actually used an evaluator that had been found by one of our subgrantees. Um, because he had impressed us so much, you know, in his work with our subgrantee, and then he, you know, took on this state project also. So I think it's just an example about how, you know, those local communities are benefiting the state as a whole also. Thank you. Um, James, do you want to highlight anything else about this kind of work? Sure. Um, I, I think that, uh, that one of the things I see that, that's really promising um, is is our ability to to all come together on this. So it's not just you know um, it's just not for those who have funding. It's just not those who have grants that are working on this. It's really everyone. And I think that that we're doing a good job over the past several years of of helping to to put that out there and and folks to recognize that we all have a stake in this. And considering the rates of suicide that we have in our state, um, you know, we really have the such high rates, especially among our, our young Alaska Native male youth and teens, um, we really need to pay attention. Uh, and I think that that having that, putting that out there, um, I think really helps us you know, um, come together on this. And the summit was one, uh, was probably our first summit that we had that really spelled it out for folks, that, that we're all in this together. Um, and then uh, the two years after that, that allowed us time to gather all that feedback, input from everybody around the state to help craft our next five-year plan. We rolled that out uh, this January, or I'm sorry, we rolled that out last January. Um, and so, and that really helped us. And, and we partner with the Suicide Prevention Council as well. And they've been really instrumental um, on, on getting the word out that we're all working on this together. And I think that's, that's really helpful for us because, um, like I said, I think we all have a, we all have a stake in this. Uh, our project officer, or GLS project officer, also um, helped us put together our, our first monthly call for all the Alaska grantees. We have, I think, five GLS grants. I think we have the most GLS grants out of any other state. 
Um, and, and so it's imperative, I think, that we come together on this. And, and oftentimes we're off, you know, running our own projects. Um, and we have those opportunities at the, at the uh, Gary Lee Smith uh, grantee meetings to kind of share and network a bit. Um, but we really have, I think, uh, an opportunity here to come together. And um, so our project officer helped us. And we're having our next call, our, our first monthly call, together as a cohort uh, on Friday. And some of those key uh, questions that came up for some of the other states about around sustainability um, is definitely a question. Uh, but I think we, um, once we meet, we can at least talk about, um, you know, again, share progress, share what's working, what's not working, um, what is our vision for suicide prevention, not just in the short term while we, while we, while we have these, this, this funding, but what is our, our five to 10 year plan, and are folks committed to that? And, um, Thanks, James. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're um, good. Thank you. That's that's really great. I know that um, that is something that Florida is doing as well. They have a lot of campus grantees, and so they're really eager to, the state grantee is really eager to connect with some of the various campus grantees who are there. Um, Allison or Christine, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, North Central Massachusetts and the coalition and sort of the momentum that developed there from the prior grant to this current grant. Um, and, you know, how to kind of just sort of, I know that it, sometimes it can take a while for things to get underway. Um, yeah, it was actually um, Berkshire um, County that um, I mentioned that did not have a coalition but was started as a result of the grant. Um, so, oh, okay, well, sorry, I was referring to some inside knowledge I had about Gardner. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that's happening, if, if that's what you want me to talk about that. Um, that was, well, the, the, um, the area of North Central was, was the area that the agency that we had been working with, we ended up um, uh, letting go of their contract um, early. And, but we were fortunate that um, in the area there was a hospital that was very interested in doing suicide prevention work and they um, did start their own um, small, it's more local but a somewhat regional um, coalition there which, um, you know, the, I think the president or CEO of the hospital actually was attending the meetings and um, so really had a tremendous amount of support. And, you know, they've done some events um, on, like, Mental Health Screening Day. They've had screenings there. Um, they are um, involved with helping to set up trainings that our, our state um, uh, helps them uh, to pay for. Um, but it's people from the region that come to attend the trainings. Uh, for instance, like in assessing managing suicide risk for clinicians, um, was done in the area, um, so we do we do see that is um, that's something that really kind of on a little bit on its own got started. Um, whereas the the Berkshire one was really directly a result of the grant because that was one of the charges that we had given when we um, funded the area. Um, I guess I was thinking about that even though the Gardner one got that area got started kind of on its own that you that um, your office has continued to be involved and work right. and as I a partner rather than a subgrantee now. Right. And I shouldn't say on their own because our the director of our, our program was very involved um, in that always. He he goes to those meetings and everything. So it, I mean it wasn't totally on its own, but um, you know, there was definitely it came from there themselves and they reached out to us and then um, and he attended the meetings. But, um, yeah, it's been um, really great, and um, they are just a, a great group and, and very passionate about doing the work. There have been some um, suicides in that region that people were very concerned about, and that is also, I think, was part of the impetus for getting things going. Unfortunately, that's often how it happens. Yes. Um, so I want to open it up uh, further to the audience for any any questions about um, this kind of regional or subgrantee work, um, you know, burning questions, thoughts, ideas, successes that you want to share. 
Um, again, go ahead and, and speak up or raise your hand and we'll help you to, um, to speak up. Now, I know at the beginning, um, someone mentioned that they were interested in learning more about um, building good relationships or improving relationships with the subgrantee. And I'm wondering if someone on the panel could say a little bit about your experience with that. I know that, James, you, you shared a little bit before. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything in addition that you could recommend. Um, you know, including perhaps if, if there's already a challenging relationship in existence there with one area or one person, but that it's really a priority area. Well, I'd like to share that I think some of the challenges have been, um, for example, we people, we really ask people to embrace that, embrace that strategic planning process. and. Not, it's not to inundate them with lots of steps and, and, and you know, of, of how to go through that process. I mean, that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, but we want them just to honor the process, to own the process and honor the process. And, and if, 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 if you're familiar with, that, with that, those steps, you know, you, you can't do it in isolation. You can't do it, you know, I can't sit in my office and fill out the forms and send it in and thinking that it's going to be a robust, dynamic uh, uh, implementation plan. That will, you know, that will do good work, and, and with the idea that that it will create some success, um, it really requires it to be um, to be owned by the, the by the community, uh, and so it needs to go beyond that. And so um, I guess that's the key challenge when we're out pro, uh, building those relationships. How we go about engaging in that process, so it's not some kind of rote, rigid, inflexible process. It, it kind of really honors people where they are. Um, and I guess my experience here in Alaska is that we have such a broad variety of people that we work with, you know, those that are very um, sophisticated in how they approach uh, things strategically. Um, they provide leadership, capacity, resources. Um, and then we have other folks that, that are very community-focused and community-based that don't necessarily have that sophistication. Um, it might be them that, have, that, that it's on their plate to do, to do everything um, because they work in a small community. Um, and they have a really hard time um, trying to bring folks into that process. So again, I would say that it's based on the, the, the context of, of the relationships and, and, and building some relevance and, and, and meaning in that process. So my experiences of going out and traveling to Akiak or Akechuk, um, you know, in the middle of winter, or maybe even during a subsistence harvest, um, that, would be <laughs> that would be challenging. Um, to, to engage people uh, to come in, you know, from the from those uh, outlying communities to have that those important conversations, and then providing the the backbone support for the person that's going to follow through on the technical aspects of of doing that, gathering that data, and and going through that planning process. So I'd say that Fairbanks completely different from Akiak and Akichuk completely different from Southeast. Um, so it really requires you to be, I guess, uh, a multifaceted in how you approach um, people and relationships. Great. Thank you so much. Well, I know that some folks may be a little bit um, shyer about speaking up on, uh, you know, in a setting like this. So I wanted to at least give people a chance if they want to share any thoughts or questions um, to do so. So I'm going to, quote unquote, go around the room. Um, for, especially for folks who haven't gotten a chance to talk yet. Um, so uh, when I say your name, um, you know, if you're on mute, please unmute yourself. And if you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share, please go ahead and do so, or you can just say pass. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Adam Trosper, and, and forgive me if I am pronouncing names wrong along the way. Adam, do you have anything that you want to um, Share any questions on this topic. I see that Adam is typing. I was just asking if you had any general questions um, or.
comments you know, that you wanted to share on this general topic or on your experience with working with regional partners or subgrantees? And you can go ahead and, and speak aloud if you can, um, or if there may be a lot of background noise uh, in your area, feel free to type in and I can read it aloud. I see a few folks are typing in some thoughts right now. Thank you so much. So while they are typing in, um, let's go to, I see, um, so there's a comment um, from Lynette Whalen. I have a lot of background noise, but I'm very excited to hear the um, strategic prevention frameworks concept being utilized so much with suicide prevention work in other areas. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, so while Adam is typing in, I'm going to go to um, Cheryl Holton. Cheryl, is there anything that you want to share, any questions that you have? Again, trying to um, give folks a chance who haven't gotten a chance to speak yet. I'm going to take that as a no. Um, Jan McGrath, how about you? Um, Jan Ulrich in Kentucky, I, I know that you um, shared a little bit earlier. I don't know if you have any thoughts or questions you want to share. So this is James. I, I just also wanted to share that I'm, I'm not sure how many other state grantees have also using the strategic prevention framework, but I do know Wyoming is also or has also. I know that we presented, uh, I don't know, when you first started, like maybe our first year, we both presented on that we were using it. And I'm not sure if a lot of other states were using it, um, but it'd be interesting to know, you know, um, after three or four years utilizing that model, how, how well they've been able to utilize that framework. Lynette, um, I'm not sure where you are in your, your grant cycle, but... Um do you want to say a little bit about where you are and how that's going for you? Aha, so Lynette is in Kentucky with Jan and Patty. So Jan or Patty, since um, maybe you have less background noise, do you want to say a little bit about how it's going to, uh, with using the, um, the frameworks? Um, I came from um, substance abuse prevention, so the framework was very much part of what we were, were operating under. So we have started working and in incorporating it, especially with our regional prevention centers. That's the language they're comfortable with. And so we're trying to figure out how to use what we're doing, but, but talk about it in their language. And while um, it has taken me basically about a year to figure out um, that I was kind of approaching it wrong because when you think about the SPIF and you think about the needs assessment and there's the prevention specialists have been taught to kind of categorize their, their work. And so suicide prevention based on the numbers alone will never rise to the very top of the list. So we've really had to shift how we were um, presenting it and approaching it so that they could understand the importance of doing the work alongside the rest of their work and um, really be able to integrate into what they were doing as well. Um, we're really um, just starting to use it in, in what we're doing on the, on the more the prevention side as opposed to more um, clinical treatment stuff. Um, but just figuring out how to, how to use those same words and processes has become um, just very apparent to us that we have to, you know, have to speak the 
right language for so, them to be able to hear. So um, you're feeding a little bit there, but what I was getting from what you're saying is, um, you know, learning to um, frame it slightly differently so that folks could recognize um, outside of that framework that suicide prevention was a, a key issue, um, even though the numbers were not going to rise to the levels that they were used to seeing with um, other challenges such as substance abuse. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, yeah. And going back to the sustainability piece, we know that uh, once, once we no longer have grant funding, we would have to, we're trying to look for ways that it gets to the, to the local level, just like the rest of, of you guys are. And so one of those mechanisms is our regional prevention centers. And so we know, for example, one group, they've just recently gotten funding from, it's called the PFS2, and their focus is on underage drinking and prescription drugs. And so working with them to figure out how to, those things have been identified through the SWIFT process as a real need, but knowing what we know about suicide and how they, how they run alongside that and connecting those pieces together, um, embedding, if you will, so that we have, have that become integral to what they're doing in their everyday work as well and, and really meshing um, the components. This is Jan, just to build on what Patty was saying. I think one of the things that, that we're realizing, I mean, just even, even would you say, Patty, this week, mm -hmm, um, exactly. is, is that it, this is not just from us outside to sub-grantees. This is actually an internal separation that, that we're dealing with. And I suspect that we're not the only one. Um, if you go to SAMHSA's website and you pull up substance abuse prevention and you look at it and you're going to see the strategic prevention framework on there and you're going to see you know, what sort of leads to the picture of very early prevention. If you go to SAMHSA and pull up suicide prevention, you won't see necessarily the, the suicide prevention framework. You'll see it presented a different way and you'll see the goals being more of that, that 360 all the way around. Um, and that's one of the pieces that we found internally that we've, we've been missing and we have to take that out to the field because in the suicide prevention world, there's not a distinct separation of awareness goes over to the right and treatment goes over to the left and clinical goes somewhere in the middle. You know, we find, for instance, if we're going into a school and we're going to promote, whether it be with our subgrantees or across our state, if we're promoting using a program like Lifelines or Signs of Suicide, we know that's not enough. We also have to make sure that they have that early intervention and referral network in place so that, you know, if, the, if this identifies somebody, that there is a way to get them help. And so I think that there are entities from both sides of that picture that maybe both sides can learn from and become stronger and more effective, but we're, we're finding that we're having to, to, I hate to say battle it out internally because that's not the vision I want to give, but we're having to, as, as Patty said, learn how to talk to each other, learn how to to let each other know where, where our boundaries are and aren't and how we collaborate even better. Great. Thank you so much. It's a really valuable point um, to be able to, you know, sort of speak the same language internally as well and have the same, get the same concept. So I want to keep um, going around the room just to make sure if folks do want to add anything in that they can. I see Ann um, Kirkwood t chatted in that um, they're operating under no cost extension for cohort five, but that this is helpful. So thank you so much. Um, either John, Johnny, Laura, or Lois, do you have anything else that you want to add or share? This is John. Pass. 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 Okay. Nothing. Go ahead. Nothing. Okay. Thank you. Well, any um, final words from our panel before we wrap up? Well, this is Christine. Um, again, I think that you know this has um, been great because I think that the benefit of the regional approach, um, which 
you know, everyone has said here is, you know, having the local knowledge and contacts, which helps leverage the work that gets done, and um, by having regional, you know, coordinators in touch with each other for ideas and successes and challenges being discussed. Um, it really, ha I think, is building a foundation um, and then adding in their, their coalitions uh, to support them and to keep the work going. I think really is, um, it's been very key here for us. And even though we're a small state, uh, these areas of the state are quite different and distinct. And so, um, it, it, you know, it's not like homogeneous. And so it, it's very, um, I think, very important uh, to really have that local knowledge um, and, um, you know, the ways that they do the work, which, which does differ, but which also can, um, by sharing ideas, can help each other to, um, to leverage what they've got. And this is Pat. And, uh, you know, I am just, I have been constantly amazed at how much um, my local subgrantees can do with the money I give them. And it's because they have the ability to leverage local resources. For example, one group um, did some wonderful posters and small wallet cards and other things that they had the um, local in the local school district. They had a uh, graphics design and printing program where they were training students. And the students did the work. And basically, um, my subgrantee, I think, had to pay for the paper. And that was it. And, and yet they, they had a wonderful little campaign that they were not so little, that they were able to put together um, for almost no money. And, so, and yet it engaged the community. It engaged students. Um, and so I think you can never underestimate even if you feel you don't have a lot of money to give to communities, um, what they can actually do with whatever you have available for them. For us, it was a very t efficient way to get the money out across the state. We're a large state ge geographically. We're a large state population-wise. And you know, I'm only part-time on the project. So at the state level, we couldn't be doing everything. And um, we, it, it just works out so well in Michigan to have subgrantees on a project like this. Thanks so much, Pat. Any final words from um, James or from uh, Christine or Allison in Massachusetts? Just one thing. I really appreciate. I believe what Jan said about the, um, you know, kind of uh, the, the SPIF and, and trying to um, think about what's happening internally. And you know, I'm here in the prevention section, and we, and you know, we have a you know teeny tiny bit of funding. We work. Our colleagues are in treatment. Has quite a bit of funding, but I think the onus is on us in prevention is to is to bring folks together and work across the table um, because we're required to. I think we have to have a large footprint in the work that we do um, and work across silos and, and create those bridges and and um, both internally and externally. Um, but I tell you what, that's what I really like about my job too. Um, that was, that's what makes it dynamic and engaging, and we have to be careful that that we're not so focused on. Uh, um, um, what the end product is, even though we we know that we have to be we have to be targeted. You know, we have to be intentional. We have to be um, data driven. We have to focus on results and outcomes, and that's what our funders want to know. That's what our legislature wants to know. So we have to work hard at that, but at the same time, acknowledging that that oftentimes by doing that, we maybe get a little maybe myopic or um, you know, kind of chasing the dragon by the tail, and we have to think also about um, about broadening our view. Um, a little bit, just to allow a little bit of um, um, that social capital to develop to determine how we're all moving together on this. Thanks, James. So, um, Allison or Cindy, any final last word from Massachusetts before we wrap up? Well, um, I, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did just um, talk about the importance of the regional um, thing, but I I would really thank everybody, especially on the panel and the people that shared things, because I think that this has been a very interesting and valuable um, thing. And um, Allison wanted to say something? Yeah, this is Allison. I just wanted to say thank you to, for the opportunity to share our work with our regional partners and subgrantees. And it's been really helpful to hear about other people's ideas and strategies for moving forward in the grant. So thank you.
Well, I'm going to um, turn it over to Adam to wrap up now. Um. Great. Thanks, everybody, for participating today. Just a couple announcements, and I'll share contact information on the last slide as well. Um, so to access the materials that we showed um, here that came from the panelists, um, so those are the things like the evaluation plan, the logic model, and things like that. You can find them on the grantee private pages on the SPRC website. And uh, the link is there with the tutorial, tutorial on how to use the pages. Um, so you'll have to log in and go check those out. Um, this webinar, we're going to archive it on the SPRC website. It'll be in the grantee area um, afterwards. And uh, we will also put the notes there as well so you can um, check out uh, what the panelists and also um, the participants contributed there. And if you have other questions um, about this topic or using the private pages or getting to the uh, webinar once it's archived, um, please contact your prevention specialist. And also if you want any additional technical assistance around anything that was discussed today, please contact them as well. And this at the end here is the contact information.